uh, we started with the idea yesterday, but how to translate some of these ideas that we talked about uh, in the past two days, how can we translate it to actual research projects? And uh, we can't um, uh, take you all the way through the entire uh, process, but we'll try and get as far as we can. Okay, and I'll talk to you along the way about what we're missing uh, and uh, you know what therefore you have to teach yourself or have or learn in some way. So what we'll try and do today is from uh, until 11.30, uh, until tea time, so that's uh, about two and a half hours, we'll talk about uh, how science is done um, and uh, how we can think about coming up with a research question, how to frame those questions, whether those questions are in the pure uh, so-called domain or in the applied domain the same principles apply. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, essential elements of study design. What we won't talk about is actually collecting data, um, curating data, analyzing data, and interpreting data. So that's one uh, quite important part that's that's missing. But for that, really, we would have had to uh, have you do action projects where you go out and collect data and then analyze. So it's you know, it's best taught that way rather than purely theoretically. So we didn't, it wasn't possible in this duration and this number of people, so we're not doing that. I should also say that what I'm trying to cover now in uh, two and a half hours is what I normally uh, teach in a master's course over maybe about three months. Uh, so over three months that means uh, something like 30 hours of or 30 to 40 hours of teaching. So it's clearly like all the other lectures you've had, there's a lot of material condensed into a into a short time. Uh, I'll try not to go too fast. I'm trying just to focus on the really essential elements and then you can take that forward and send some reading for you. Okay, so uh, maybe we can start with somebody uh, volunteering to answer the question. What is the domain of science, what's the goal of science, Professor, in a broad manner of speaking, what are we trying to do? Seeking truth. Seeking truth about? Yeah, so science, but science more generally, what's the domain of science? Understanding nature, something new. Yeah, but about what? What is the domain? What is the, what is the scope of science? The the scope is the universe, right? The universe and everything in it is the scope of science. And we'll, we'll make that a little more specific. Um, and so if that's the scope of science, then what, what do we want to do with this with the scope of the universe? What do we want to find out? <clears throat> anything and everything, and we want to know the answer. Uh, not anything and everything, for example, uh, there are some questions that are non-scientific, lie outside the scientific domain. For example, what's the meaning of life? And the meaning of life, to my mind, is not a scientific question. We can talk a little bit about that. We won't get too much into the metaphysics of it all. Um, but we are typically asking questions uh, about, uh, about the material world, yeah, about matter and energy and how they combine and things like that. We're not asking questions in science. Typically, we don't ask um, philosophical or what called metaphysical questions uh, that are beyond the material world. Yeah. Um, so, but within this, within the universe, I would argue that we have three broad uh, kinds of questions that we asked, three broad kinds of goals. We want to describe the world or the universe. We want to, want to understand what it's made of, where you know, what different categories can we classify entities into, where those different categories are. Those categories might be rocks or species or atoms or whatever uh, you care about. So we we want to describe. Description is a kind of a fundamental building block of, of what we do in science and research. Uh, and so you can, for example, uh, Imesh showed the, uh, the pattern where there are more species typically in the tropics than as you go towards either of the poles. You know, so that's a description. It's a description of how species richness, that's the number of species, varies with latitude. And that's a very interesting kind of description. But we may not want to stop at description. We are often, once we've described something, we've described a pattern, we go on to ask additional questions. 
And in particular, we might ask why questions. Why is it? It's, a, it's an interesting pattern. But immediately, our brain tries to make meaning of it. There must be some reason why there are more species at the equator <coughs> compared to towards the poles. Right? So we don't stop at description. Typically, we also want to explain those patterns in nature that we see. Correct? Is that fair enough? We want to explain. We don't just say that uh, you know there are more tigers in this tiger reserve than that tiger reserve. That's an important starting point. We often want to find out why is that the case. What is it about this tiger reserve that allows you to support more tigers or beetles or butterflies or whatever it is that you're interested in? So you want explanations typically. Uh, and uh, finally, we sometimes, some science, not all, uh, is very interested in prediction, in forecasting, in saying that if uh, we, need, we want to understand nature well enough, that we can predict into the future, we can predict in time. And of course, a lot of science does this. So, you know, the weather forecast does this, the climate models do this. And very often, ecologists may all, might also do this, right? especially when uh, somebody comes for advice and says, you know, how do you think I should manage these populations? Or do you think I should burn, you know, is fire bad? Uh, should I burn or should I not burn uh, a particular, let's say, grassland, a wet grassland in the energetic plane? And there, what you're doing is when you're giving advice, you're sort of predicting, you're saying, well, if you burn, then this is likely to happen. If you don't burn, then this is likely to happen. So if you burn, do a dry burn or versus a wet burn, and these are management tools that are used in the Gadgetic Plains for wildlife conservation, yeah. um, then this is what's going to happen. So we're predicting. Uh, often experts, quote-unquote experts, predict very informally, but we can make formal predictions. We can make formal statistical or mathematical models that will allow us to uh, predict into the future. Uh, and those models may be, you know, better or worse at those predictions. Uh, famously, um, uh, Newton's laws are very good at predicting, you know, how Let's say a storm will fall, or how a, a satellite, uh, you know, um, a spaceship will come back into uh, into the Earth's atmosphere and where it will land in the sea. Right? We have to predict those things, and and uh, physical sciences are very good at prediction, uh, typically. Um, but the biological sciences, uh, including ecology and so on, because I think they deal with much more complex uh, material. There are many forces that impinge. Uh, and determine how many species there are in an ecosystem versus there are relatively few forces that act on a stone as it's falling or a rocket or whatever. Uh, and so it's much harder to predict. But nevertheless, we sometimes have this ambition to predict. Now, scientists uh, who are in, operate at these different levels usually uh, look down at scientists who ask questions at one of the other levels. So somebody will say, oh, that person's only, only uh, describing Right? Or the predictors will say, or the people who do predictions say, that the explanation is not enough. We really need to predict. But I don't think we need to fall in that trap. Right? We need to figure out what's important for our particular purposes. And if it's plain description of what's there, for example, taxonomists describe species. Right? You don't particularly go ahead to explain. Although maybe phylogeographers and uh, people who study biogeography and so on may try and explain the pattern. But I don't think we need to. Uh, Think of one being superior, any of these being superior to the other. And in all this, our assumption is it's a materialistic assumption. Science is materialistic. That doesn't mean that scientists like to go and buy things. Uh, the same word can have very different meanings. Materialism is a stance that uh, the universe is made of matter and energy and nothing beyond that. And therefore, if somebody makes a claim that goes beyond matter and energy, then you, as a scientist, you say, well, that's not a scientific claim. May very well be true, but I'm operating in, within the material domain. That is, of things that I can see and measure. Uh, even if I can't see, I have instruments that can measure and so on. So if somebody says that there's you know, some magic, I can do some magic. Telekinesis, no, I, can, I can make things move with a, with a thought. And if there's nothing that connects me to that object in the material world, that's not possible. And so, as a scientist, you'd say, Fine, maybe you can make things move with a thought. It's not within my domain. Yeah. Uh, so normally scientists take the stance that the uh, universe is made of matter and energy, and in principle we should be able to measure matter and energy, and we should be able to measure these sorts of things. Okay? So that's just a, a general uh, uh, starting point. Now, <clears throat> the methods of science 
are varied. I've just listed some of the main ones here, especially the main ones we use in ecology, ornithology, and so on. Um, the first one is simple observation. What is out there in the world, in the universe? Yeah, we can measure the heights and the weights, and we can look at the colors, and we can look at the behavior as we learned yesterday. This is all about simple observing, passively observing the world. And a lot of, uh, as I say, ontology, ecological science is that. You're measuring behavior, you're just measuring the behavior you want to be as far as possible from the world so that it doesn't get disturbed by you. You don't want to interfere because then you're collecting information that isn't representative of what the world really does. And you're just observing outside the system that you're trying to observe. Um, but there are very powerful, a uh, very powerful tool to understand is an experiment. Can somebody describe to me what an experiment is? Somebody, what's an experiment? What does that mean? Controlling the variables. Okay, that's one element. Yes, sorry. But I don't know what is the result. Trying something. Trying something and you don't know what's the result. Yeah, you don't have any assumptions about the result. I see. Okay. Or you're testing out a particular hypothesis. Maybe. You're testing a particular hypothesis. We'll come to what a hypothesis is and uh, you know some characteristics of that. Uh, you're testing some idea. Let's call it an idea. You know, we like to hypothesis is a fancy word. Not hypothesis. I don't have an idea. I have an hypothesis. You know, that separates me from the person on the street. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts on what an experiment is? Change the yeah, so the key part of an experiment, there are several parts, but one key part is that you are actually changing the system. You are directly interfering, I don't mean that in a bad way, or manipulating, again I don't mean that in a bad way. You are directly changing the system to see what happens. Yeah, so that's one crucial element of an experiment, that you as a researcher or scientist, you go in and you change the system. Another crucial element is that you don't know, like for example, I am an endocrinologist, uh, I'm studying bird song, and I want to know that if I inject or insert a little capsule that releases testosterone slowly in a bird, in a male bird, whether that bird will uh, sing more. Okay, so I have, a, I have some idea about the relationship between testosterone and song. So I insert this capsule. So I'm doing something to the bird. I'm not just observing the bird. I could also, if I was in observation mode, I could observe the bird sing and then catch it as soon as I can and take a blood sample and measure the testosterone. Okay? I'm not manipulating the system. I'm just measuring what's there. So that would fall into observation. And let's say I find that, oh, you know, males that tend to sing a lot, there's a relationship with more testosterone. It means that don't sing very much, they have less testosterone. So I'm very curious. I don't know whether this is actually a cause and effect relationship. Is it the testosterone that's making the birds sing more? And I want to experimentally test that. Yeah? So what I do is then I, I catch some males and I put this testosterone capsule. And then uh, when they've recovered an hour or two hours or a day later, then I observe their singing. Does that make sense? So that's an experiment. They are manipulating the system. The second way, uh, what else have I missed? Can somebody say? I do this for 10 birds, and I see whether they sing more after the capsule was implanted than before the capsule was implanted. Is that a good experiment? Yeah, so there's a concept of control, which is also quite crucial in an experiment, which is that when I caught this bird and put the capsule, I've not only put the capsule with testosterone, but one is I've caught it, and the act of catching it might itself change the behavior of the bird. I've put in a capsule, so even if the act of catching doesn't change his behavior, just inserting something under its skin might change his behavior. And so I want to make sure, but I'm not interested in whether catching it makes us change or inserting the capsule makes it. I'm interested in whether testosterone makes it change its behavior, right? So then I have a control, and what will the control be? <laughs> yes, so you do exactly the same as with the treatment word, it's called the treatment except the capsule does not contain testosterone. Maybe the capsule contains saline or some neutral uh, substance, yeah? And only then can I conclude, if I compare the two groups, only then can I make some conclusion about the effect of testosterone on singing, 
otherwise it's confounded with time, it's confounded with, or confounded with time, with handling, and with the surgery. Yeah? So, and there are of course other elements that we'll talk about, but the key point is an experiment, you manipulate the system, and typically you have a comparison that you need to uh, compare against, and that comparison is often a control, which is where you do everything the same as in the treatment, except for the key variable that you want to look for. A lot of us would be familiar with this, right? Uh, observation and experimenting. There is a, also a, a really valuable endeavor here in understanding uh, science, which is modeling, by which I mean uh, mathematical or graphical modeling. Typically, nowadays, you do mathematical modeling, which is where you think of a phenomenon that you're interested in and say, well, how is there a way to represent this phenomenon in some sensible way mathematically? And yesterday, I think Moshmi uh, showed various mathematical models of population change, of population growth. And these are built sort of from the bottom up to say, okay, let's just think about a population, an abstract population. There's births and deaths that add and subtract. Let's forget immigration and immigration for now. How might births and deaths combine to contribute to population growth? Now we have this population growing at a particular rate if the ratio of births and deaths is constant. But in real populations, we don't think ratio of births and deaths is constant because at some point, the population will get to the size where, let's say, food is, is limiting. And the per capita resources, which may be food, uh, become less and less as the population grows. And so the ratio of births and deaths should, should shift. Um, and a theoretical ecologist might think about this you know, with more or less detail and write out a series of equations that describe these, this sort of abstract or idealized population. And then, and this I'm talking about a very simple model over here, right? But then the the field biologists, it's 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 not common that somebody who's does a lot of mathematical modeling also is a, a what's called an empirical biologist. Somebody goes and collects data. Sometimes they coexist. Some field biologists do a little bit of modeling on the side, and some modelers do a little bit of field biology on the side. But um, but the idea is that these models then provide new ideas for the field biologists uh, to go in and test. So the field biologist, might, the modeler might say, look, my model depends on the assumption that as population growth increases, the per capita resources decrease. Or as population growth increase, as population size increases, then uh, the uh, births will decrease and the deaths will increase. That's an assumption. So that assumption has to be tested. And then the field biologists say, oh, that's really interesting. Let me go and see. I have a convenient population to test this in. I'll see if that's actually true. There's a very nice interchange, potentially, between the empirical biologist and the uh, mathematical biologist. Yeah? So that's another, for those of you, especially with the more quantitative backgrounds, maths or engineering backgrounds, uh, either doing theoretical uh, th theory, you know, in, in common use, the word theory is kind of uh, used in a negative way. So, oh, that's just theoretical, you know. But theoretical biology or mathematical biology is a discipline, and it's a very, very important discipline. And if you have a knack for quantitative uh, things, you know, maths and so on, then uh, that might be a good niche for you. And finally, I'm just going to mention uh, comparative analysis, which is not very different, really, from it's just an extension of observation and experimentation. This is where, rather than you going into the field and collecting new observations or doing new experiments, you ask across the world. Who has done this kind of experiment? Uh, and can I gather all that data together? Because I want to know, in general, what happens, not just with bio weaver birds or with mockingbirds in, the, in America or something like that, where individual people have inserted this testosterone capsule. right? And they've said, well, mockingbirds do this when you <coughs> put testosterone. Buyers do this when you put testosterone. But I'm sitting back and I'm going to say, what generalization can I make across birds? <coughs> And then you gather all the studies that have done this, and you put them together in a formal framework. Not just a verbal argument, in statistical mathematical frameworks, you can combine them together so that if there are enough studies, you can make a general statement. You can say, by and large, males don't change their seeming behavior when you put testosterone. That would be a, a result from a comparative analysis, generalizing across, across words. So while individual studies are very interesting and important, and of course unnecessary, if we want to make broad generalizations, then we need to aggregate whatever information is available out of the question 
and uh, combine it in some kind of comparative analysis is what it's called. So, in general, what we're doing here is we're gathering evidence, or rather, maybe we're thinking about ideas, so the modeling is more about generating ideas, the observation and experiment is about gathering evidence, and then we're trying to see what's the, how congruent, how uh, consistent are the idea and the evidence. And then we try and be, you know, a little more confident. If there is consistency between the idea and evidence, we're a little more confident that the ideas may be correct. If we have an idea that the reason that there are more species at the equator than towards the poles is, let's say, um, something about uh, the primary productivity, right? The primary productivity means is, is the rate at which new plants, uh, plant biomass is formed, is, is generated from nothing. Plants, by the way, you know, right? The plants just get nothing. They take water, they take carbon dioxide, um, and very little else, and they produce stuff out of nothing. All the biomass in plants, most of the biomass in plants, comes from comes from where? In the ground? It comes from the air. They're creating matter out of air. It's just, it's remarkable. Anyway, that's an aside. So primary productivity. So then I see, okay, there's, okay, and consistent with this, there's more primary productivity at the equator than at the, at the poles, but that's not enough. I want to see maybe there are some places along the equator that have more or less primary productivity. And I would, from this idea, I would predict, I would suspect that even though, the, uh, you know, places along the, uh, the equator, maybe because it's higher up, you know, on the mountain, it should have less species diversity, <coughs> species richness, if primary productivity is driving species richness. So I'm keeping the latitude constant, I'm taking advantage of variation in primary productivity, and I see whether it's consistent with my idea. If it is consistent with my idea, then I have a little more confidence in my idea. If it's not consistent with my idea, then I have a little less confidence. And I might do this repeatedly at different latitudes and so on. So we're always going back and forth between the idea and the evidence, the idea and the evidence, and the strength of your idea has to be only as strong and not stronger than the strength of the evidence supporting this, that idea. We'll talk a little bit more, perhaps, about those sort of things. Any questions so far? It all kind of makes sense. I mean, I'm hoping, I, I might not make sense, but I'm hoping that the logic of science has to make sense. Uh, otherwise, we're all doomed, <laughs> presumably. OK, so then we'll get into this, these ideas. What are these ideas? So somebody mentioned the word hypothesis. Uh, the hypothesis, a hypothesis is an idea. That's an idea uh, about um, what happened or how things work, something like that. And we've learned maybe uh, something called the hypothetical deductive method. How many people have learned in their classes about the hypothetical deductive method? Oh my gosh, only one person? This used to be standard. Do you guys believe this, Mish? Only one person has heard of the hypothetical deductive method. Is that remarkable? Did you learn it in, in college? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but Umesh went to medical college, and medical college is famously uh, 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 devoid of evidence, no? <laughs> anyway, um, so this is, is sometimes, the hypothetical reductive method is sometimes described as the method of science. Now, I'll say it is a method of science, not the method, because science does not have any one method, it is a collection of many methods. But the hypothetical deductive method is what basically was Sherlock Holmes uses. Now, tell me how many people have read Sherlock Holmes? Any Sherlock Holmes story? Okay, a few people. So Sherlock Holmes is a detective, and he's a peculiar kind of detective, um, because he uses the hypothetical deductive method. And, uh, you know, there is, it goes like this. There's been a murder, there's a dead body, nobody knows who's done the murder. Well, obviously, if some people have seen, you know, somebody hacking at this person, then we know who the murderer is, so there's no mystery. But there's a mystery because there's a murder. Uh, the CCTV was switched off, I don't know. Um, and uh, we have to figure out, you know, who the murderer would be. Um, and what Holmes does is he makes some observations and he comes up with an idea about who it could be. Or what group, what group that person might belong to. You know, might be male or female, 
or a friend or a stranger, something like that. Right? To then we narrow it down. And so Holmes says, well, I really think this is this must have been somebody known known to the family. Right? And he says that if that idea is true, so let's call that a hypothesis. If that hypothesis is true, that the murderer was somebody known to the family, then, so this if-then statement, then some deduction must be true. I deduce some consequence. Right? If the it was a, a person known to the family, then the dog would not have barked. If it was somebody a stranger, the dog should have barked. So what Holmes does is instead of globbing around the body and so on, he goes off somewhere and he says, he asks the neighbors and said, did the dog bark in the night? Right? And let's say all the neighbors say, no, we slept completely soundly, we didn't hear any dog barking. And so the fact that the dog did not bark in the night makes Holmes a little more confident that this hypothesis is true, that it was a friend of the family, a known person, not a stranger. Does that make sense? It's a hypothesis. From the hypothesis, he deduces a prediction. Prediction is something that can be observed or measured or can ask people. And depending on how the evidence matches the prediction or not, Holmes then has more or less confidence in the initial hypothesis. You know, and suppose the neighbors had said, oh yeah, that dog was barking like crazy, I don't know what happened. And then Holmes would say, well, maybe it's more likely that it was a stranger than a, uh, than a, than a known person. Does that make sense? So we start with the hypothesis, an idea about what happened. We deduce some predictions. We go and collect the data that allow us to see whether the world matches those predictions or not. And then we come back to the hypothesis, whether it's strengthened or weakened. That makes sense. So that is the essence of a hypothetical deductive method. Uh, this is uh, the uh, list over here. So we start with some kind of puzzle. Uh, <clears throat> we think of explanations, ideas, hypotheses. For each hypothesis, we deduce. That's what's called deduction. Deduction is where you take a general statement, and then from the general statement, you derive specific uh, prediction. And then you collect evidence relevant, uh, relevant to the predictions. Uh, this is, um, you know, I'll give you another example. Of, um, <clears throat> uh, shall we? Well, let's think of. Um, actually, it's not a bird example. Let's think of tigers. Okay, there are tigers in different uh, tiger reserves, and we have an idea that uh, what limits tiger populations, tiger densities is the amount of prey. Now, you might think that's logical, but actually there are two general camps. One camp of tiger biologists believes that tiger numbers are limited by prey. The other camp of tiger biologists <laughs> believe that tiger numbers are limited by poaching. Okay, so this would be called, the prey controlling tiger numbers would be called bottom up control. The poaching limiting tigers would be called top down control. And so that if it were prey limiting tiger numbers, then if we went to different tiger reserves and counted their density of prey and counted the density of tigers, we should see a positive relationship between them, where there's more prey, there's more tigers, and there's less prey, there's less tigers. So you see that we have an idea that tiger numbers are, uh, so why do tigers numbers vary across tiger reserves? This is a puzzle, a question. Uh, I think of a possibility, possible answer, which is that prey numbers may be governing tiger, tiger numbers. I deduce predictions, which is that if that's true, then if I look across tiger reserves, there should be a positive relationship between number of tigers and number of prey, or density of tigers and density of prey. And then I go and collect the data relevant to that, and I see whether the evidence is consistent with my prediction. If it is consistent with my prediction, I have slightly more uh, confidence in, uh, in, the, in that particular explanation. Um, yeah? So if the evidence matches the prediction, the hypothesis is tentatively supported. If the evidence does not match the prediction, if there's no relation between tiger numbers and prey and deer, then the hypothesis is not supported. Then I have to think of other hypotheses about why tiger numbers vary between uh, national uh, tiger reserves. And then I have to do the same. Does that make sense? So I go on until <clears throat> I have some pathway where I you know, have more and more confidence that this particular phenomenon, this particular hypothesis is supported. Now we. The question then arises is, can you prove a hypothesis? Uh, yeah. Can we be sure about something? And usually the answer is no, at least not in one go. 
what usually happens is as our predictions match the hypothesis, we have more and more and more and more confidence in that hypothesis. And especially if the if none of the predictions of the other hypotheses are supported, only this one idea, or this one phenomenon, this one notion of how the world works is supported more and more. And then we have more and more evidence, we have more and more belief in that hypothesis as the evidence accumulates. But we would very rarely say, definitely in ecology we would never say that I know this for a fact. I know the truth. Somebody used the word truth. Truth is a slippery concept. It's very hard to reach. Um, uh, there are some things that are true. Right? There's some things that are true. Uh, yeah, um, if... I'm not going to use a human example. Okay. <laughs> if I if I a video record a peregrine falcon swooping and catching a pigeon and eating it, I can say that peregrine falcon caught and ate that pigeon. Right? That is a truth that nobody would really... Uh, of course, in this era of doctored videos and so on, you say. But anyway, there's you know there are witnesses, there's video recording, and that's true. So those are what we might call trivial truths. They are they're small truths with a small t. Uh, the big truths are more difficult. For example, if I want to know, uh, if I if I have an idea that the peregrine falcons that eat pigeons, that in eating pigeons they actually control the pigeon population, that they set an upper limit on the pigeon population. That is a hypothesis. Other hypothesis could be that disease sets an upper limit. Another hypothesis could be that food sets an upper limit for the pigeon population, not the peregrine falcons, right? And I might gather evidence for one or the other, and it's more and more supported, and I'm more and more confident that, let's say, the predation from falcons controls the pigeon population. But I'd, very, I'd be very brave to be able to say that nothing else is important, only the falcons are controlling the pigeon population. I might have more and more uh, evidence about it, but I. I wouldn't really say that this is the truth and nothing else is the truth. Okay, so scientists should, maybe we don't always do this, but scientists should always be very tentative about the big truths, not the small truths like I saw somebody hit somebody, right? that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a small truth. That makes sense? Yes. So we typically uh, uh, don't say the hypothesis are proven, we rather say that the evidence is consistent and so on. So then the question arises, what we're talking about the word hypothesis, what, what is this word? What is a hypothesis? When is an idea a hypothesis? When, it's, when is, it, is it not a hypothesis? And this very confusing in the literature, people don't have a consistent definition of this term. People often uh, use the word hypothesis to mean any idea about anything. Yeah? Um, so let me contrast two uh, situations. One is, um, there's a dog sleeping in a doorway, and uh, the next day it's gone, and there's blood marks or whatever on the And the two situations are one when there's a CCTV camera, and I can see if I look at one in the morning of the footage, there's a leopard that comes in, and grabs the dogs and take dog and takes it away. Okay, that's one situation. The other situation is no CCTV camera, and all I know is the dog is gone, that blood stains. Okay, now. If there is the camera footage, I can see very well that you know, the leopard's taking away the dog. There's no need for any hypothesis. There's no need for any conjecture. I have the evidence right there. But if that evidence is not there, then there's something that was not observed or cannot be observed. And then I need to think, you know, was it a leopard? Was it another dog? Was it a person, a dog kidnapping person? Um, you know, we need to think of different possibilities. So a hypothesis really is only interesting when it's a statement about something that was not observed or cannot be observed. Not about something that we can just go and observe. For example, it's not a hypothesis to say that I think there are more species in uh, <clears throat> larger fragments of forest than smaller fragments of forest. Right? That's my idea. There are more species here than there. That's not a hypothesis, because you can just go and measure the number of species here and measure the number of species there. Yeah. Things that we can directly measure, we don't have to hypothesize about. It's things that we cannot directly measure. For example, we cannot directly measure, I think, whether there's competition between plants. I have an idea that there's competition between plants for light. I can't directly measure that, because I can't see plants fighting each other for access to light. But I can deduce some predictions. If plants compete for light, 
then what I should see, for example, if I do an experiment, if I grow two plants in different pots, and the different pots is important because I'm separating their other resources, right? Where I'm not allowing them to possibly compete for water or minerals or whatever. But I grow two plants close together in different plot pots, and I see how well they grow. And I grow similar two plants apart from each other and see how much they grow in a given amount of time. Then my prediction, if plants compete for light, is that the plants when grown further apart will grow faster and do better than plants that grow right next to each other, that I have made to grow next to each other. You see, I can't directly observe competition, but I can deduce the predictions from that idea, from the hypothesis that plants compete for light. Yeah? I can't directly observe whether falcons control pigeon pop. I can see falcons killing individual pigeons. But just because you see some cause of mortality doesn't mean that that cause of mortality is what is maintaining the population and limiting the population. Yeah, that's a common mistake we all make. So these processes, the processes that are happening at the population level or the, sometimes the physiological level that we cannot see, we cannot observe directly, those processes usually we need to hypothesize about and reduce predictions. Whereas I just want to see if this river is more polluted than that river. I don't have to hypothesize that this river is more polluted than that river. No? I can just go and measure. So, in my mind, a hypothesis is a statement about an unobservable and often about a process that is uh, unobservable, inaccessible to us. Um, and if you're interested in something observable, then observe it. You don't have to dress up your, your research in some fancy language and say, I have a hypothesis. I have a hypothesis that uh, okay, this is a good one. It's not a good example again. I have a hypothesis that children who are malnourished uh, have lower cognitive skills than children who are well nourished. Okay? That's actually a prediction. It's a prediction from a higher thing that we can't observe, which is that the nourishment that a child gets um, affects some brain development, right? And the way in which I try and test the hypothesis is I said that if nourishment affects brain development, then what I predict is that children who are malnourished should have differently developed brains than children who are well nourished. Does that make sense? Does that sort of clarify the difference between a hypothesis and a prediction? And also, I want to say that even though uh, some of us at least learned that the hypothetical deductive method is the method of science, I just want to reiterate a lot of science does not involve any of this hypothesis deduction nonsense. It's about description, classification, very valuable stuff. It doesn't have to be uh, about that. So that was just an um, uh, introduction to uh, you know some sort of background about uh, how uh, science is approached, how science is done, some of the terminology. Uh, in the next section, we'll talk about how you might begin with this background, how you might begin to frame questions. Uh, research questions, scientific questions, in non ecology, ecology, things like that. Uh, so, before that, are there any? Uh, do you want to frame any questions for me?